So the title of my message is Easter in Us. You know, in our American culture, it's so much about Easter around us, not necessarily Easter in us. It's the making of new. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God wants to work something new in you. Now, last week we saw how resurrection was something that was entirely unprepared for. I mean, nobody expected it. Whether you was a Jew or a Gentile, nobody expected resurrection. There's a huge difference between resurrection and, and being raised. My daughter was raised from the dead in front of doctors, medical doctors. They said there's no way to believe it. She was raised from the dead. But she wasn't resurrected from the dead. Why? Because when she was raised, she was raised in the same body that she had. And when God raised her from the dead, he, she wasn't perfect. We had to continue to pray, and we saw a lot of miracles of healing in her. But when Christ was resurrected, he had a new body, not an earthly body. And that's why on Wednesday night I preached so much on why demons will not say Christ came in the flesh, on the importance of understanding flesh. Because to Americans, it may be an insignificant thing. If it didn't happen, you and I couldn't even be born again. And so I'm not going to recover that, but we're going to talk about that a little bit because, you know, I shared um, last week with Ludwig Wittgenstein, the greatest 20th century philosopher, and the big argument he got with Karl Popper, who was coming to his own terms, and he went to clash with the big man head on head with his own paper. And we don't know, you know, if Wittgenstein got that Popper out and, you know, wanted to poke him with the hot rod that he got out of the fireplace some say he did but some say the rod that he got out of the fireplace wasn't hot at all some say he confronted him head on and he went out the quick door quickly and some say that didn't happen at all how many of you realize on the day of resurrection nobody was prepared that's why when we read in the gospels we read the accounts the way we do and so strange features that just kind of catch you up from last week is there's a silence in the Bible in the actual resurrection stories because nobody is quoting the Bible on resurrection day. They're not saying, oh, well, this is like prophesied, you know, it's what the prophets, no, no, nobody's doing that. Nobody's saying, well, Jesus told us how he's got to die and on the third day he'd be raised again. Nobody's mentioning that. Nobody's saying that. Why? Because this is impossible. This cannot be happening. This cannot be taking place. The next part of the story that's amazing is the, the ones who tell the story are women. If somebody made this story up, women wouldn't be in this place. Why? Because in that day, in that culture, in that season, in that time, a woman couldn't even take the witness stand in a trial because her witness was worthless. And Jesus said, man, let me shock the world here. He said, give me some women. Let's bring some women in the garden. Let's bring some women to the tomb. Let's let some women tell those old male apostles that they saw Jesus. And you see, somebody would have gone back and fixed that. They would have taken that out. But you see, they didn't fix it. Why? Because that's not the way it happened. The portrait of Jesus himself. Some thought he was a gardener. They thought he was a traveler on the Emmaus Road. He had a body that could walk through walls. He scared the disciples half to death. He said, be not afraid. Hey, guys, don't be afraid. It's just me, Jesus. <laughs> well, that's enough reason for us to be afraid because it is you. How did you get here? Well, don't you remember when I told you all these things? No, we don't remember. Oh, yeah, you did, you did say something about that. Another thing that's strange is there's no mention of the hope of the church. I mean, Jesus is resurrected. He's come out of the tomb. Mary says, oh, my goodness, it's Jesus. Guys, guess what? We're all going to be resurrected. Come over here. No, no, they didn't say that at all. But yet it's in the scriptures. It's in the prophets. It's in the Psalms. Resurrection day, the very first Easter, is raw. It's raw. It's right there in front. It's raw. We have to, as Americans, learn how to read it 
and set ourselves in that day, in that culture, in that time, in that season, what they believed, what they didn't believe, where they were at, who they were, whether they were male or whether they were female, whether they were a disciple or whether they were a Gentile or whether they were the Roman guard sitting at the foot of the cross when Jesus died and he cried out and said, surely this is the Son of God. Believers and non-believers alike. And 30 years after the resurrection, the gospel crisscrossed the world. Everybody heard about Jesus. It's weird on that day because no one expected it. and No one went back to correct the mistakes. They didn't go back to fix it. One city set for a portrait and four different painters, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John all painted the painting. And when each had finished, they could go and say, that was a Rembrandt. That was a Van Gogh. They could point out the styles of the portrait, but the one thing they all had in common, it was the same person in the portrait. Same color of hair, same little smile, but different angles. Easter has a very present age meaning today it's been whitewashed so many times to meet our culture you know through all the paintings of europeans and americans gathered gathered around the the last supper that you know sitting at a long table that didn't exist i can go in forever and ever in semiotics and show you those things that never happened that way because it wasn't part of their culture uh, more than likely they were laying down they had benches that were part bench part bed uh, at breakfast, you, you ate your first meal standing, you ate your second meal sitting, you ate your last meal laying. Just part of culture that Americans are not very familiar with. So we go back old school. How do we go old school? I didn't realize it's 20, I had 20 years here. I didn't even realize that this is 20 years where we moved into this building. How many of y'all thank God we're paying a 30 year note off in 20 years? Amen. But if you want to go old school, you know, Pastor, we like it old school. Well, what do you mean by old school? 40 years ago, if we're going to go old school, why don't we go 2,000 years ago? <laughs> so I like them old songs. How old do you like them? <laughs> the Lamb of God. What was God feeling? Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you today to help us, Lord, to grow and mature in you and your word. Teach us your word, Lord. Let our, let our hearts be tablets that you can write upon, Lord. Write upon us, Lord, with the word of your son, Jesus, as we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, let me fly through some of this. I got a lot of stuff for you today. This scripture studied and applied then is more or less a, a universal witness of the early Christians. When you go back into the Gospels and you read about Easter Day, that very first Easter, uh, with all of its flaws, with all of its different perspectives, it doesn't all line up. Did Jesus meet with them in Bethany and Jerusalem? Did he meet at one? Did he meet at both? How many women showed up? How, you know, a lot of different things. But, but it is what it is. They did what they did, and they tell stories that tell, not because of religious angles. They have stories that tell because something happened that day. Just like uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein and, and Karl Popper um, at Cambridge, the, one of the most famous meetings ever. They couldn't agree on what happened, but all of them went out of that room saying something happened, and actually an entire book on philosophy was written on that room in that day, and they couldn't come into agreement on what happened. And these are PhDs in philosophy, PhDs in the law, PhDs in theology. These guys are trained for the truth, and yet we're like, I'm not sure what I saw. What did you see? Can you imagine what it must have been, the shock, to be looking for a dead man and have a gardener speak to you? And you say, oh, well, you know, thanks for taking care of the flowers. And then all of a sudden, the gardener says your name? Jesus? Is that you? And then he has to tell her. What does he have to tell her? Don't cling to me, Mary. Don't cling to me. Let me go. It's better for you. No, Jesus, I'm never. Were you kidding? I'm never letting you go. 
I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Mary, it's going to be better. They didn't go back and fix those stories. Something happened. Two things we know. We can take a two-pronged hypothesis on this. Number one, Jesus' tomb was empty. And number two, the disciples encountered him in ways that convinced them that he wasn't a ghost. He was real. They simply saw or thought they saw someone they took to be Jesus. The stories wouldn't have been generated if they didn't actually believe this to be true because every one of those and in, in these days takes for granted experiences involving the dead, particularly the recent dead, and they had a language for that. They had a language for this, and it wasn't resurrection. So Jesus was buried according to Jewish tradition, which is designated in a two-stage process of how Jesus was buried here. Number one, they wrap his body up, they wrap it tight, they put the spices and all of the ointment and the spike nerve. That is put on there for a purpose of the body decomposing. Now, this is a, a two-step Jewish process. The body de decomposes. The spices are there. He's placed on a shelf. We call it a sepulcher. And then when the body has de decomposed, the bones are then collected and gathered, and they're put in what's called a bone box, which is then put in the ossuary. And so somebody would have been there to collect the bones of Jesus. Somebody would have been, been waiting. And if not raised, someone would have collected his bones. The bones alone would be enough proof to know Jesus was not resurrected. And without an empty tomb, disciples would have been quick to say, you know, hallucinations, ghosts. You know, all of these other things. Grave robbery was also very commonly known during that day and that time. That's why Mary concludes in John's gospel, Mary said, they've taken him away. Perhaps it was the gardener, she says. That was the conclusion of the Jewish leaders who, who in the gospel of Matthew, they said his disciples took him. But to explain how early Christians believed and, and that Jesus had been, been raised, we have to say at least, we have to at first, we have to understand that the tomb was empty except for some grave clothes. The tomb was empty. And, and they did see and talk to someone who gave the appearance of a solid physical body and yet Jesus was changed more fully than they could describe. Something about him was not the same. Now, like I said, he could walk through walls. That's different. Something about him. I don't have time to finish this and fulfill it all, but Jesus literally was the new creation that we all will be. As the last Adam, he died. Wednesday night, I preached on the fourth Adam. He became. How many of y'all know that, that it does not yet appear to you what you shall be? But when you see Jesus, you shall be changed, for even as he is, so shall you be. Let me tell you something. When you die, you're going to get out of this earth suit. But let me tell you, God's got something better than an earth suit. A lot of times as Christians, we think he's just going to give me my body back and it's just going to be a little better. No. No, 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 no. We're going to become as he is. Amen. How many of you, you realize and you recognize, I don't want me just a little bit better, a little bit younger, a little bit stronger. I want something better than me. Yeah. Amen. We have this phrase, you know, the world loves, I just want to be the best me I can be. Man, I don't even want to be me. I'm like, I don't want to be me. I don't even want the best me. Because the best me is so far under what God has for me. Amen. You wouldn't even like the best me. So I'm crucified with Christ. I've died. I've been buried and I've been raised up with him to be like him. Amen. But wait, you ain't seen nothing until when I put my glorified self on. Shoot, I'm working hard on muscles right now. Man, alive, what am I going to look like then? Woo. God, you've been thinking this for me. Been thinking that about you before I created you, son. I've had this for you from the beginning of time. I'm a good God. I have a good plan. So, so both the meetings and the empty tomb, they're necessary. Neither by itself is sufficient. You know, the pagan view and, and then the Jewish view, resurrection's impossible. 
the disciples' view, resurrection was impossible, but they did see him walk on water. They did see him feed thousands out of a couple of loaves and a few fish. They did understand that Jesus said with him anything was possible. How many of y'all know anything's possible? It, it's all... But the, the phenomenon of cognitive dissonance is when, when people really want something to happen to be true, but they face overwhelming evidence. It's, it's as if they become more strident in announcing their claims. But, but theories like this wouldn't explain away the fact there were so many witnesses. It wasn't like Mary and a few disciples said, oh, no, he rose from the dead. That's what we believe. The whole world saw him. He didn't hide. There's authors whose opinions were they weren't for Jesus. I mean, in Jerusalem, they, they took a whole gate on the eastern side where they said, you know, Jesus said he was going to return. They walled it all up. And then to make sure that would not happen, they put a graveyard in front of it because a good Jew can't walk through there. Oh, yeah, they saw him. Oh, yeah, dead people got out of graves when he was resurrected. Oh, they know about Jesus. They just don't like him. <laughs> Why do they not like him? Because he failed their agenda. Let me tell you something about your agenda. God don't care about your agenda. He doesn't care about my agenda. He's got an agenda. Amen. He's been doing this before you, you've been around. He had a plan for me that even when I messed it up, his good plan for me made an exception because he made that plan before I messed up. It's still a good plan. So the disciples were emphatically not expecting Jesus to be raised. Thomas is not a believer. Paul is not a believer. Paul's killing Christians right now. This is what Paul's doing. He's slaughtering Christians. I mean, you say, well, all of these people love Jesus, and they would say anything. That's not true. They didn't all love Jesus. They didn't all say something. Thomas said, if I don't see the dude, I'm not going to believe. This is incredible. This is, I, I know you guys, y'all are all my friends, and I love you, but please forgive me for not believing you. You're all liars. I don't believe this stuff. Trust the story. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the story, and the story was with God, and the story was God. And in the same way, we could say they had a new experience of grace. They, they felt forgiven in a new way, with a new faith and a new power, but this doesn't work. Just saying it doesn't bring you a step closer to being resurrected. Just saying it. So resurrection can function as a metaphor in parables, but it's not a metaphor. It's not a new religious experience. Saying he's resurrected when he's not is not inexplicably historical. And so there's some arguments, uh, some small arguments. Number one, that Jesus didn't really die. Someone gave him drugs, and they made him look dead, and, and he was revived in the tomb. The answer to that is the Romans were really good at killing people. They were really good at it. And the people that crucified Jesus were the best of the best. That's all they did is crucify people. Yeah, that's not a, not a good answer. Well, well, when the women went to the tomb, they met someone else. Perhaps it was James, Jesus' half-brother that looked a lot like him. The answer is, well, they would have known soon enough if it was James. Well, well other accounts are, are biased, and so, you know, Maybe this is biased. Well, the answer is, is so are all histories and journalism. Even a photograph you take comes from an angle and a perspective. Well, lots of people have visions of someone they love who just died. The answer is they knew perfectly well about these things, which were more common in their time than it is today in ours, but they had a language for that. They would often say, well, it was his angel. It was a spirit. It was a ghost. They wouldn't say it was Jesus. One of the most popular and what, what actually uh, was going around in that day was it's a rich spiritual atmosphere to say there was an, a spiritual experience that they interpreted through Jewish categories that Ju Jesus was alive spiritually and they were in tune spiritually. Yeah, that's real cultic because Jesus came back in the flesh 
glorified, resurrected. Jesus didn't come just to make death a little softer. He thoroughly destroyed death, absolutely destroying it, which is also the greatest fear in the Bible is the fear of death. Equally, three little small scale, you know, Jewish tombs, especially those of the martyrs were enshrined. Well, Jesus's wasn't. The early church's emphasis on the first day is hard to explain if something didn't really happen, which it did. The disciples weren't likely to go out and suffer and die for a belief that wasn't anchored in fact. Well, that's, that's awesome, but the, there's a possibility they were just genuinely mistaken, but they weren't. So my next point is the empty tomb and the meetings with Jesus are well established by arguments and history. And we take these in combination as the only possible explanation for the stories that grew up so quickly among Jesus' followers. These stories were so embedded and they grew so quickly that they weren't changed because you've got to go back to oral tradition. You've got to realize none of this was written until perhaps decades later. The first book in the Bible isn't Matthew. It's 1 Thessalonians and Thessalonica, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. John wrote his when he was an old man. John was the youngest of all the disciples, perhaps 14 at the time. All the disciples are dead. John is the last living, and, and people are already saying, well, you know, I'm not sure that Jesus ever really existed. And then John began to write the story. And I love it. John said, I touched the face of God. He said, you say he was, because the power of an eyewitness in that day and that time was, was very dramatic. And notice that he was a male. It wasn't Mary saying that. Because now the story has progressed. And so in, in any other historical inquiry, the answer would be very, very obvious. It would be so obvious that we wouldn't be arguing it. And it's shocking to all. It is earth-shattering, amazing, and unexpected. So to conclude something really happened, it must have really happened. It must have been resurrection. All of the signposts, all of the signs point that direction. Every single, not just in the Bible, stuff outside of the Bible. And so the best historical explanation is that Jesus of Nazareth, having been thoroughly dead and buried, really was raised from the dead on the third day with a renewed body, not just merely a resuscitated corpse, as people sometimes uh, defensively say, but a new kind of physical body. The body left an empty tomb behind it because it had used all of the material of the original body, which possesses new properties, not that... that uh, Nobody had experienced or imagined it because it had never happened before. New creation fully materialized in the flesh of a new Adam. Wow. And so there's different types of knowledge. How many of you realize science studies things that are repeatable? History studies things that are unrepeatable. So we have two different sciences. One's history, one's science. You know, Caesar only crossed the Rubicon once. And if he would have crossed it again, it would have meant something entirely different. There could only be one first landing on the moon. The fall of the second Jerusalem temple, what we call second temple Jude Judaism, fell in A.D. 70. Not any other time after that. Historians are, are not shy about saying that these events took place even though they cannot repeat them. You can't re repeat Caesar crossing the Rubicon. You can't repeat the first lunar landing on the moon. You can't repeat any of these things. But historians are not shy to say that happened. Okay, but... But that can't happen because we know that this sort of thing doesn't happen. So history is full of unlikely things that happened once, but they don't happen again. So there we draw analogy. And the problem with analogy is it never quite goes far enough. So Christians did not think Jesus' resurrection was one instance of something that happened occasionally elsewhere. It happened one time and one time only. It happened right here. They didn't believe it happened anywhere else. 
They didn't believe it happened with anyone else. Like I said, Lazarus was raised from the dead. My daughter was raised from the dead. I've got enough miracles in my life. If you just want to study me, you can study miracles. But she was not resurrected. The evidence of the resurrection is so massive that it's impossible to believe in it without ceasing to be a scientist. Let me ask you some questions. How does a scientist, how do they believe? How, how, how does that scientific position go? Ask a scientist what they can believe about something. All right, number one, what can science explore? And how can a scientist know or believe certain things? What commitment is the process of being wedded to science expected to have in all of the other areas of life? If there is a, a scientific approach to listening to music, is there a scientific approach? Is there a scientific approach to watching a football game? Is there a scientific approach to falling in love? You can't put it in a beaker. You can't put it in a test tube. You can't put it under a microscope. So there must be some impingement to what scientists can believe. Let me ask you this. Can a scientist believe her husband actually loves her? A true scientist can't. Can a scientist believe in faithfulness? So we have science and we have history. Resurrection in the first century meant something physical, not simply a spiritual experience. And so if we go back to the first century Christianity and we look at it, we realize resurrection meant something, something who was physical, thoroughly dead, but physically thoroughly alive, not simply surviving or entering a purely spiritual world, whatever that may look like. Resurrection necessarily impinged on the public world to this extent that if this thing is true this is the third element of knowing if this thing is true sometimes human beings individuals believers like me people like you and even communities are confronted with something they must reject outright because if they accept it it demands the changing of worldview If you're going to accept this, your whole worldview is going to change. And otherwise, if not, you must totally reject it. There's no in-between. You see, Christianity is not about the pie in the sky, the here and now, the, you know, by and by. It's not grace while we wait. It's not pie in the sky. It's eternal What does it mean? It means Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. Jesus is God. Jesus as Messiah. I don't have time to touch on the three, the actual four different worlds that Paul lived in, from Roman and Hellenistic to Judaism to Gentile. Here's a little story. A wealthy member of a college gave a priceless painting as a gift, but it simply wouldn't fit into any of the available spaces in the college because it was so magnificent. I mean, put it in the best place and it outshines. So what they did is they rebuilt around the unexpected gift, discovering the best things about the college were enhanced within the new structure, and all of the problems that people were aware of were being dealt with through the, the new gift and the new structure. So the key about that illustration is that there must be some epistemological, I mean, re relating to theory of learning here, at a point where they overlap so that the people from the existing college and the people coming into the college could all come to a place of peace, happiness, tranquility, well-being, and the key about that illustration is that there, there had to be something that happened because the donor doesn't just come along, blow up the college, and present the painting and have a plan for what they do. And what the Easter story does and the whole existence of the church does is it poses nothing other than a huge question. Huge question. Set that question within the life of the community. 
Set that question within the scriptures. Set that question within the narrative that lays out the whole world view all the way to the last days that I believe we're living in. Set that within personal openness to God, generative thinking. Lord, help me understand. Lord, show me. Lord, you talk and let me listen. Set that within not only creation, Genesis 1 through 3, but recreation. You see, history brings us to the conclusion that there really was an empty tomb. There really were sightings of Jesus, resurrection, and transfigured. Scripture brings us to the point where if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Jesus was so new, they didn't recognize him. Are y'all getting this just a little bit? Now get out of your... 21st century mind get out of your Americanism get out of your you know your Bible with verses and chapters and get into the story learn what the story says I'm gonna get ready to close with Thomas the story of Thomas found in John 20 is going to serve as a parable to this Thomas let me say that again Thomas, how many of y'all know there are things that happen that are true accounts that also can be parables? Rich young ruler is an example of that. There really was a rich young ruler. He came and said, what must I do, Jesus? I've done everything. I think I'm perfect. Jesus said, keep this commandment. I did it all done. Check it off. Go sell all you have and follow me. He said, I can't do that. He had no idea what God would have given to him. No idea of the blessings of God. He, was, he turned down an invitation to be one of the original disciples. He might have written a book. We don't know his name, but it could have been named after him. It's also a parable. Let's look at Thomas like a, a good historian who wants to see and touch. Thomas was a good historian. Thomas wasn't as much a scientist he was a good historian. He wanted to see and he wanted to touch. And Jesus presents himself to his sight and invites him in for the touch. But Thomas doesn't. Thomas begins with doubt. I'm going to quote to you from a, a famous Easter oratorio. A, a, an oratorio is bigger than a symphony. It's bigger than a concert. It involves voices, choirs, music. It's, this, is, this is the biggest of the big. Let me quote this to you. And it's written about Thomas. The sea is too deep. The heaven is too high. I cannot swim and I cannot fly. I must stay here. I must stay here. Here where I know, how can I know? Here where I know, what I can know. Jesus then reappears and invites Thomas to see and touch. Suddenly, a new and giddying like possibility appears before him. Thomas says, The sea has parted Pharaoh's host. Despair and doubt and fear and pride no longer frighten us. We must cross over to the other side. The heaven bows down with wounded hands. Our exiled God, our Lord of shame. Before us, living, breathing, stands. The word is near and calls our name. New knowing for the doubting mind. New seeing out of blindness grows. New trusting May the skeptic find new hope through that which faith now knows. And with that, Thomas takes a deep breath. And he brings history and faith together in one truth. And Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God, you are you said that you were he touched him he felt him he loved him he believed him 
That's where some of us may dwell. The Lord, I question, is precisely the one who is the climax of Israel's history and the launch of a new one. Everything, everything, I do mean everything, changed on that day. Nothing has been the same. Nothing ever will be. If you can trust in him, what did Jesus say to Thomas? Thomas, blessed are you because you have seen and believed. But even more blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. I want to rip apart the thinking in your mind that sometimes American Christians get. about God being private. Jesus was crucified out in the open. They put king of kings in several languages over the top of his head. He is personal because he wants you to personally know him. He doesn't want you to know him through a friend or through a family member or through a church or through a pastor. He wants you to have personal knowledge and relationship of him. But this is where we have to understand he is not private. You can't have a private relationship with him who stands at the crossroads of life to speak. He doesn't hide. He doesn't retreat. He doesn't go back. He only goes forward. The one thing, I'm going to really close with this. The one thing that all of those that saw Jesus had in common, the only thing, they didn't understand everything they saw at this moment, but what did every one of them do? They went and they told somebody else. They went and they told somebody, you're not going to believe this, but I saw Jesus. Yeah, you're crazy. I don't believe you. No, I'm serious. I saw him. I saw him. I touched him. I was walking and he walked through a wall. Oh, my goodness. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I said, oh, well, we are afraid. And he said, but it's me, Jesus. And it was. And I got to tell you, well, I don't know if I believe. Well, I'm telling you, he's alive. He's risen from the dead. And now it makes sense to us. Those things that he told us before he went into Jerusalem, as John says in his gospel, he told us we didn't know. We didn't know. We didn't get it. On the night that he said, take, eat, this is my body, they ate and looked at each other. He said, don't have. He said, drink this. This is my blood. No, 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 no. Let's not. John 6. He said, unless you eat of me, you will have no part of me. And on that day, many fell away. And he asked his disciples, are you guys going to go also? And Peter said, where would we go? You're the way. You're the truth. We have no idea what you're talking about, but we're not going anywhere. Peter preached the first New Testament sermon. They all got drunk, filled with the Holy Ghost, singing to themselves and psalms and melody and spiritual songs. And people thought, oh, my goodness, these, these guys are drunk. And Peter stood up early in the morning and said, these guys aren't drunk with wine wearing as you expect or think or believe. These guys are full of the Holy Ghost. And they all heard them speaking in their own language the wonderful story of Jesus. And they're like, that dude doesn't speak this language. Holy Spirit prophesied. They're everyone. Thousands got saved that day. 
thousands gave their lives to Jesus. And out of those thousands, many of them lost their life for that same Jesus. Oh, did they believe? Oh, they believed. And they said, you know what? You can take my life, but I know what comes afterwards. You can't take that from me. Paul said to be absent from the flesh was better because it meant you were present with the Lord. The last thing we haven't seen, but we will see when we become that new creation in body, not just spirit. I love you guys. I'm just asking you, tell somebody, please, tell somebody. Tell somebody about Jesus. Invite them to church. I want to put more chairs out. I want your friends to know Jesus because he is personal, but he's not private.